When did you first get into MMA? Because it felt like you were in earlier than a lot of people. Well, I called the first UFC. The first time I worked for them was in 1997 at UFC 12. Wow. But what and did we're you... about almost at UFC 200 now. So, yeah, it was a long time ago. But what did you see? That, that, or did you just say, hey, it's a gig and I'll take the gig and let me try it? No, um, I, was, uh, I was a martial arts student from the time I was a little kid. I had competed in a lot of martial arts events, and I, it was just something that I was always fascinated by. And when the UFC came along, for a martial artist, it was the, really the question we always had was what would happen if one style competed against another style. So when someone actually came along and put it together and had this event called the Ultimate Fighting Championship where anything could happen and in and, and the, the days that I was in they had no rules in terms of you could grab guys clothes you could hit them in the groin you could you didn't have gloves on I mean it, it, it was crazy back then and we really wanted to find out what style was the best and it turns out there really isn't a best style there's sort of the best techniques that have been boiled down to what the, I think the best style is now which is mixed martial arts it's actually become a style in and of itself. And I think that because of the UFC, from the time of 1993 to where we stand today in 2016, there's been more evolution in martial arts than there has been in 10,000 years. Who was the first star? Hoist Gracie. Hoist Gracie was the first star because he was the guy who won the first UFC, and he's also the guy who first showed the world that, you know, if you watch, like, old martial arts movies, like Bruce Lee movies, it was always the little guy with skill beating the large men. Now, that's something that everybody always, like, hopes and dreams for. But in the real world, it's usually, like, bigger, stronger, faster people that beat up smaller people. So Hoist Gracie was really not just the first star in the UFC, but the first guy to prove that technique and skill are actually more effective than size and strength. So... So it was, it was huge in the sense that you got to see what everybody had always hoped for, that there was a possibility that someone could use their skill to overcome a massive physical deficit. Now, you've done a lot of things. Stand-up comedian, you're calling UFC fights as an analyst, and you were on a TV show, you were on a couple of TV shows. So if I said, being on stage trying to make somebody laugh, calling a UFC fight or being on Fear Factor, encouraging contestants to eat bugs. What's the, what's the most enjoyable one out of all those three? Uh, well, it's definitely not Fear Factor. That, that was a great gig. It was nice to have a TV gig and all that jazz, but uh, it, it would probably be stand-up comedy. probably would be the most enjoyable. Very close second would be the UFC. If I had to boil it down, but I don't, I'm lucky I don't have to boil it down. I mean, I'm incredibly fortunate in that there's a bunch of things that I like to do, and uh, a couple of them happen to be jobs. The uh, UFC 198 seems to be overshadowed by UFC 200. Is that, is, is that fair to say? Now, I mean, press coverage wise. Um, it has been in terms of hype. But it, when it comes to uh, hardcore fans, I don't believe it's overshadowed at all. It's one of the most anticipated cards of the year. First of all, because they're in Brazil, and obviously, as we talked about before, Hoist Gracie coming from Brazil and introducing the world to Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, it's, it's one of the most important or it's one of the most important nations when it comes to mixed martial arts, probably the most important, in fact. And this town that we're in, and it's called Curitiba. Curitiba is the home of, of Shootabox, which is an iconic Brazilian jiu-jitsu and uh, mixed martial arts team from Brazil. And it's for the heavyweight title. And this guy, Fabricio Verdum, who's defending his title Saturday night against Stipe Miocic, is without a doubt one of the all-time greats. This is a handful of all-time great mixed martial arts fighters. There's Fedor Emelianenko, there's Cain Velasquez, and there's Minotaro Noguera. This guy, Fabricio Verdum, has submitted all three of those guys. And he is, without a doubt, one of the all-time greats. And he's fighting against this guy named Stipe Miocic this uh, Croatian-American guy who's a stud, just a really, really dangerous guy, one of the toughest guys in the division, and a real threat to anybody at heavyweight. So it's a really exciting fight. 
And the card itself is unbelievably stacked from top to bottom. You've got the top two and three middleweights in the world in Jacare Souza versus Vitor Belfort. You've got former middleweight champion Anderson Silva taking on one of the fastest and most explosive guys in the world in Uriah Hall. It's the debut, debut of Chris Cyborg in the UFC. Mauricio Shogun, who, uh, who's a former world champion, is there as well. I mean, it's just a stacked car from top to bottom. Single scariest guy in this sport is who? Well, there's really no single scariest guy in the sport. There's so many talented fighters now. Um, as far as, like, just sheer mentality, I might go with UFC welterweight champion Robbie Lawler because he's just so ferocious. He's just uh, a guy that you, you really, you got you got to pack a lunch. I mean, just, he just keeps coming no matter what, and he wins fights a lot of times just based on sheer determination and willpower uh, as well as his physical skill and knockout power. There's just so many good people now. It's really exciting to watch the sport evolve and, and grow and to, to be a part of it from, for me for, since 1997. It's just been... Uh, Unbelievably fortunate. He's Joe Rogan, the UFC color commentator, UFC 198, coming up Saturday night. Uh, Conor McGregor's future is what? Well, he's uh, up in the air right now. I mean, he was supposed to be a part of UFC 200, but he didn't want to do his press obligations. And, you know, he's a mercur- mercurial figure. He's kind of crazy. And that's what makes him a great fighter. And it's also what makes it, I'm sure, very frustrating for his handlers and for the UFC, but, you know, the UFC has some pretty clear media obligations that fighters have to fulfill. They have to promote fights. He didn't want to do it, and so they had, uh, they had an impasse. So uh, hopefully he's going to be defending his title or fighting Nate Diaz somewhere around UFC 2002 or, or three. So hopefully somewhere around the, the summer, Sometime in August, we're going to see him fight again. But okay, you know, okay. but but we he, really don't know because nothing's been signed and nothing's been announced. But Joe, he has promoted UFC 200 more than anybody else by not being part of the press that, coverage. That's arguable, sure. But he has obligations. You know, there's contractual obligations that you have. I mean, you could say by not being a part of it, he's actually made more headlines and got people more excited, and that is absolutely true. But that doesn't really that doesn't really dismiss the media obligations that he has. Like, the UFC has very clear contractual obligations that fighters have to fulfill. It's just a part of the deal. And it's how they promote fights. It's how they promote cards. It's how they get everybody excited about these upcoming matchups. You know, he thinks, I guess, that he has done enough. And, you know, he could make that argument. And if the UFC agreed with him and they let him out of this contract or, or his contractual obligations, you know, that would be between those two parties. The UFC chose to not agree with him and not think that he did enough. And the UFC thinks that this number, 200, is an iconic number, a very important event, and a huge, huge card for the UFC. And they just wanted everyone to do their job. And they didn't think it would be fair to the other fighters on the card. Uh, if he didn't have to perform his media obligations, would anybody ever sanction both sides? Um, would anybody ever sanction something with McGregor and Floyd Mayweather? Maybe. I mean, it could be sanctioned, but it would be uh, highly questionable. First of all, it would be highly questionable whether or not Conor McGregor deserves to be in a boxing ring with arguably the all-time best boxer ever. Uh, Floyd Mayweather at 49-0, and 0, having beaten everybody in front of him, having looked just stellar against some of the best fighters in the world throughout his entire reign of his career. How could you make the argument that a guy who has really no boxing record to speak of should be fighting him? Um, and in MMA, you would say the same thing. How could you make the argument that this one guy with no mixed martial arts fights is fighting a guy who's a world champion in the UFC? Okay, but who so, would have a better uh, honestly, chance, Honestly, I don't think so. Uh, if I put well, excuse me? McGregor as a boxer or Floyd uh, doing MMA, who would have a better chance? Um, I think McGregor as a boxer has virtually no chance. I think Floyd Mayweather, if you look at how he fights, 
he fights against Canelo Alvarez. If you look at the unbelievable skill that he shows inside the boxing room, he, he makes some of the most offensive boxers in the world, offensively-minded boxers. He shuts their offense down. I mean, Floyd is a brilliant tactician. You might not like him because of his personality. You might like, not like him because of the way he promotes himself. But as a technical boxer, he's absolutely brilliant. But the same can be said about MMA. If Floyd got in an MMA fight with Conor McGregor, he would get killed. Conor would just kick his legs out from under him. He would take him down. He would kick his body apart. The distance is so much different. The technique variation is so different. The spacing is different. The fact that you're fighting five-minute rounds instead of three, the fact that he can grapple, I mean, it would be a mismatch. It would be a very clear mismatch. Also, Conor's a much larger guy. Connor regularly walks around at around 170 plus pounds and then cuts down to make the UFC limit of 145. He's not a 145 pound fighter. He would be much much larger than McGregor if they got than um, excuse me than Floyd if they got in the octagon together. I'll leave you with this. Could you take Dana White? Could I take him? I could take him to the movies. He's a good friend of mine. Could you take him in the octagon? <laughs> take him where? You know, you mean I mean. a fight? Would yeah. I win in a fight? Yeah. I, I don't think I don't think about that when it comes to my friends. Oh, I do, Dan Patrick. I do all the time. Do you, do you yes. think about that all the time with your buddies? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's where you and I part ways. Okay, all right. Well, all right. <laughs> Could you take Glazer? Oh, Jay. Yeah, Jay's my friend too. Oh, you okay? I don't know. So you take him to the movies? Okay, that's right. Uh, have fun this Saturday night. We appreciate it, Joe. Thank you. 